All right, so I will I will get started here. Dear Father, we uh, thank you uh, for this time we have to meet together and study your creation. Just pray that you be with us today. Help us to just understand more about convergence and divergence. And I just pray that students would ask good questions as they have them, and that you would be glorified in what we do here this day, Lord. In your name, I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, so let me get this unpleasantness out of the way. Let's see here. I will hand the sheet around tomorrow, so we'll, you know, um, we'll have that. Let's see here. So last time, last time I, I told you guys about the direct comparison test, right? Um, I said if there exists an M such that you have for all the terms in this, in the, in these sequences, a sub n and b sub n, you have this inequality, right? Um, then you can compare the convergence of the a series to the b series, right? And so, if you have the smaller series um, diverges, it implies the larger series likewise diverges. If you have the, the the bigger series, if that if the larger series converges, then the smaller series must also converge, since we're dealing with non-negative terms, right? Now the proof is down here, and the proof again relies on, um, well, it relies on the tail theorem that I proved for you yesterday. I think one thing I didn't emphasize enough here um, yesterday about these direct comparison tests is you don't have to have that inequality for the whole, the totality of the series considered, right? As long as it's true eventually, that suffices to prove the comparison, right? So like, it's basically you just, you know, look at the, the tail of, um, the tail of each series, and then you can compare those, and, and that's that's how it goes. Um, and again, like I said, if you read the details there, it's the bounded monotonic se sequence theorem. I have a couple more examples here I just wanted to just look at with you guys. Um, so the one was this 1 over 3 to the k square root of k example. Um, and so this is a nice example. Um, so like this one's pretty simple. Basically, the idea is, um, well, let's see here. The square root of k is greater than or equal to 1, right? So if I get rid of the square root of k, I've done what? I've made the denominator smaller, hence the fraction larger. So I can directly compare series built from this versus series built from that. But the series formed from summing 1, one over 3, well, that's geometric, right? That's the geometric series. And um, when, when you write the geometric series out like this, the first term is a, right? And the, the ratio between any two, two sub subsequent terms is, is r. So that converges, in fact, to 1 third over 2 thirds, also known as a half. So therefore, the, um, the larger series converges. Consequently, the complicated looking one, 1 over 3 to the k times square root of k likewise converges, all right, by direct comparison test. That one was pretty easy. In terms of the inequality, we didn't really have to do any kind of justification of it, right? This one, on the other hand, here, 1 over k to the fifth plus 7 to the 1 sixth power, I felt like, um, you know, this one requires a little bit more thinking. If 2 is less than k, 32 is less than k to the fifth, which gives us this inequality, right? k to the fifth plus 7 less than k to the fifth plus 32, which is less than 2 times k to the fifth. This is kind of a sneaky trick um, because then, um, and then down here, what I'm doing is I'm showing you, if you didn't believe it already, the, the sixth root power is an increasing function. How do I see that? Well, if I differentiate the sixth root power, um, that's increasing, right? Um, because the derivative is positive. So that's an increasing function. And increasing functions preserve inequalities, right? So that means that if, if I have this inequality, which I argued up at the start of the example, then I take the sixth root of both sides. Again, it's an increasing function, so it preserves the inequality like this, and I get that. And then I turn it over for the series of interest, and I say, okay, well, this, you know, 1 over k to the 5th plus 7 to the 1 6th root is greater than uh, 2 to the 1 6th times k to the 5 6th power, right? But that's what I'm after because you see here, I can factor the constant out, and then I'm looking at a p equals 5 6th series, well, the tail of a p equals 5 6th series, which diverges by the p series test, right? So the, the things I'm showing you in this example here, there's a few different things going on, right? Like the one of them is we can use calculus 
if in doubt about whether a function is increasing or decreasing, differentiate. Look at the sign that will show you whether the function is decreasing or increasing. Other things we are, are always doing um, is, you know, like trying to make the denominator smaller or larger to make the fraction respectively smaller, well, rather larger or smaller. Listen not to my words. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. So the, if we make the denominator larger, it makes the fraction smaller, right? So there's always that. All right, so there's just a couple examples. That brings us then to the limit comparison test, all right? So, um, which I'll write down over here. So what I'm gonna try to do today is I'm going to try to um, talk about the proof with you guys and write the theorems over there, and then I'll put the projector away once I've gotten through a few theorems, and we'll just work examples, okay? That's my game plan for today. But I need to, uh, I need to write these theorems down. Whew, it's a good thing I didn't have a quiz at the start of class today. Let's see here, so theorem. Uh, suppose a k and b k are positive sequence, right? a k, b k, positive sequences, right? And what else, What's, what else do we have here? Limit comparison test. And suppose l is formed by the limit, limit as k goes to infinity, of, what is it, a sub k over b sub k? Okay. Given this, all right, and, and that's either finite or infinity. All right, then here's what you get. Number one, if L is positive, Right, and um, then, <clears throat> then rather, the sum of a k converges if and only if the sum of b k converges. All right. Now I should mention that what I just wrote is the limit comparison test as it appears in Stewart. So if you're in Dr. Sprano's section, this is the limit comparison test. End of story right here. There's no infinity involved, all right? What I'm about to write for you is the extended limit comparison test, um, which is sometimes useful. So, what? When, when L is equal to infinity. So to, or, or zero. <laughs> so if L is equal to infinity and <clears throat> the sum of A sub K what I have there converges. That implies that the sum of BK converges. All right. And three, if L is equal to zero and the sum of BK converges, is it converges or? Yeah, it's converges, yeah. Then that implies the sum of AK converges. All right. So, like I told you guys last time, Dr. Sperano is known for uh, making the proof of number one of this theorem, like problem one on his second test. It's happened many a semester, all right? It's an open secret. He tells them, I'm going to do this to you. You just have to learn the proof. I give you back these points, right? Should I do the same? Tell you a proof that's going to be on the test? Okay, the, the proof of the geometric series will be on the test. I, I, I guarantee it. All right. Okay, so um, let's let's look at the proof together here. If I can, I, f I forgot. I should have made you guys uh, remind you guys to you know take some drama mean before we look at this. But um, we'll we'll do our best despite the shakiness here. Come on. All right. Maybe you just have to get in the rhythm with it. If you can sync, if you can like, if you can bob your head the same like the same frequency, it's pretty quick. But yeah, I think we need like we need like springy chairs, you know, like chairs with a spring that you can tune to the screen. But then we'd probably like create some kind of earthquake in Demos or something. I don't know. It'd be bad. Okay, so the the proof is is actually very simple, um, especially for part one. 
So suppose the limit exists and it's a real number, all right? That limit existing, that gives us um, the ability to choose epsilons that make certain things happen, right? That was the definition of the limit. But if we, cho if we suppose that limit exists and we suppose that, um, suppose that BK converges, all right? Well, then we can choose R, which is greater than L, right? Um, right, because if, uh, well, if, any, if, if L is a real number, is there a number, other, other number bigger than it? Well, yes, right? I mean, any real number, you always pick a number bigger than the number, right? So if that's the case, then if we make epsilon equal to R minus L, well, that's a positive number. Okay, fine. And if epsilon is a positive number, then by the definition of the limit of a sequence, we can choose an N such that if K is larger than that N, we get that the absolute value of the quotient of A sub K and B sub K minus L is less than epsilon, all right? That's just the definition of the limit of the quotient existing. And if that's the case, then we have that the absolute value of the quotient minus L is less than epsilon. Great, what does that mean? Well, that means that this difference is before and after the absolute value and minus the absolute value, well, before and after minus epsilon. So epsilon is R minus L and minus epsilon is L minus R. I don't think I even need, I don't, I don't think I even need this side of it, okay? So I'm just working over here if I remember right. So look at this inequality here, add L to it, what do you get? If you add L across this, you get A over K, a to the k, a sub k over b to sub k is less than r. Great. So what that means is that we have the series, uh, the, the kth term a sub k is less than r times b sub k for all k larger than the n, um, the n which is furnished by the existence of the limit. So then we can use direct comparison tests, right? Um, b sub k times the sum series form b sub k r is, less, is equal to this, um, that was two days ago we proved that. Friday, I forget, we, we, we proved this before. Remember the series, if the series converges, the scalar multiple converges. Likewise, we can pull, we can pull numbers outside the series. So R is just a number, I can pull it out. That's R times a convergent series, which is therefore convergen, converging, convergent. Um, therefore, by the direct comparison test, we have that the larger series converges, therefore the smaller series must likewise converge. So what I've just done is I've proved that if you have L is positive, well, um, if L is positive, right? Not even that. Did I even assume L is positive? I didn't, right? I just assumed that L is a real number. And I've proved if L is a real number and B sub K converges, it implies A sub K converges. So um, we've, we've actually, we've proved the, Converse direction of number three of number one, and we've proved number three at this point because number three says if L equals zero and B sub K converges, then A sub K converges. So at this point, we have proved the reverse direction of number one and, and all of three. So what's next? Next is to suppose. Well, let me just go down here. So I'm pretty sure Dr. Sprano doesn't require his students to do all of that on their test too, like for his. T proof of test, proof of this theorem, he probably just says, because the limit exists, there exists an R, which is between L and um, the terms, right? If the terms eventually go to L, that means you can find an R between L and the terms of the sequence, right? In other words, you can find the existence of the limit means that you can find an R in here for K sufficiently large, yeah. Oh. Uh, yes, I must be thinking about the next thing. I'm thinking about the next one. The uh, yeah, yeah. So his his all right his <clears throat> his proof is going to be for positive. <clears throat> well, anyway, let me not talk about his proof. <laughs> we just have to talk about our proof, right? But um. <clears throat> I don't think there's any mistake in my first paragraph, right? I mean, you're just saying I can't directly compare it to Sopranos, right? Correct? Yeah, agreed. So, um, so next, suppose that the limit is positive, all right? Limit is positive here, and suppose that the this, this series A sub K converges. Um, notice then that the, in, the reciprocal of L 
is equal to the limit of b sub k over a sub k, all right? And <laughs> then I can apply the argument of the previous uh, paragraph to show that b sub k converges. So, yeah. Um, and then here's the argument for infinity. If the, if the limit's infinity and we assume that a sub k converges, then it follows that the limit of the um, b sub k over a sub k is zero, hence by the argument for the first paragraph, we get that it converges. Anyway, so this is the limit comparison and its proof, all right? So um, tell you what we're gonna do. I'm going to stop presenting um, this and I'll write on the board for a bit. And then we'll go back to the projector when I get to the next theorem. How about that? <clears throat> so example one, suppose you're up against the sum, k equals one to infinity, of k to the 13th plus k to the fifth minus seven. And I'll put, let me make it more interesting than notes. Let's put up here uh, k squared minus k plus two. So this is a totally obnoxious problem, right? Given our previous techniques, like applying the direct comparison test directly here, <laughs> you could do it, but it would be a real hassle because there's addition and subtraction, right? So you'd be working against both of those at the same time. Um, and, and so like, listen here, let me just tell you the secret sauce. Um, like here's the, this won't get you all the credit, but this will probably get you the right answer for most of these problems. How do you figure out what's gonna happen? This is essentially what? This is essentially k squared over k to the 13th, right? Which is one over what? k to the 11th for k much, much greater than one, right? So my intuition for this problem is that, and it says, hey, this is gonna converge because this is more or less the p equals 11 series, right? And if p is greater than one, it converges. Limit comparison makes this pretty easy. So we're gonna compare to what? Um, we're gonna so I'll think of this up here as my uh, a sub k, all right? And we'll let b sub k equal one over k to the 11. Now, since I just made this up, we should watch out, make sure we don't have any kind of, I'm a little bit worried because it seems like it's conceivable that there's a zero. Ah, no, I don't think it happens. It would ha if it was gonna happen, it would happen by, uh, um, well, let's just hope that your instructor has made a problem which is reasonable. Um, although it's not quite reasonable, is it? Why is this not quite reasonable? Yep. Um, it, can be negative. it can be negative is a good answer. I would say it starts out negative, right? So like this is equal to, if I plug in one, I get what? Two over, looks like minus five, yeah? And then what's the next term? I got a lot of four over yowzers. Um, two to the 13th, I think that wins, right? Pretty sure that one wins, uh, plus two to the 32 minus seven. I think the minus seven is, is gonna lose out in that battle, right? Oh man. There we go, 32. So anyway, that's positive. How do you know that it stays positive? If you're in doubt, how could you tell that the denominator stays positive? Check this out, quick calculation. If we take DDK of K to the 13th plus K to the fifth minus seven, what do you get? 
13k to the 12th plus 5k to the 4th, right? Which is manifestly greater than 0 for k greater than or equal to 0. So if we extend, n, if we extend k continuously, you can easily see that there's no other place where that denominator can be 0. The only place where that denominator has a 0 between 1 and, it has to be between 1 and 2, between 1 and 2 because the denominator is a polynomial in k, and it changes from being negative to being positive, but polynomials are continuous. Therefore, there's a 0 in there by the intermediate value theorem. Who cares where it is? It doesn't happen at 1 or 2. And the larger point here is if we're beyond 2, we're looking at a series of positive terms, right? Assuming that nothing, no kind of funny business happened upstairs. But upstairs, I think, likewise, if you take the derivative of the top, you get 2k minus 1. And 2k minus 1 is going to be positive for k larger than 2. So again, it keeps increasing. It can't double back on itself and give you another 0. All right. Anyway, all of this said, we definitely have um, 0 is less than a k. Um, oh, I don't know about the inequalities, but we have rather this, a k comma b k is greater than 0 for what? k greater than or equal to 2. So we, 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 we do have to throw out the first term to apply the, the limit comparison test. That's all I'm saying, OK? So the limit comparison test can apply, will apply to the tail of the series here. Um, and so like a more complete statement of the limit comparison test would throw in here, you know, for k sufficiently large. If I threw that in, then we don't have to quibble with this next time. So, OK, anyway. So then what? Let's look at our L. It's the limit, what? Limit as k goes to infinity. Sorry, so much pre-processing on this one. Um, k squared minus k plus 2 divided by k to the 13th plus k to the 5th minus 7 and divided by bk, which is what? 1 over k to the 11, right? Now, the way I wrote this is dumb. For future purposes, when we write a quotient, let's not write a quotient. How should we write a quotient? Like when you're up against a sub k divided by b sub k, how should you write this? You should write this as a sub k times, you know, 1 over b sub k. You should, you should think of it like that. And when I say think of it like that, I really mean we should just directly write the following just to make our life simpler. Because we're going to be looking at quotients a fair amount in here for the remainder of these tests. Like a, well, not all of them, but about half of them are based on quotients. This one and also the ratio test, those two, both quotient based, fraction based. So it's just much smarter to write your fraction like that as the product of the, the, the numerator and the reciprocal of the denominator in this case, right? Because if you're taking a fraction of fractions, it's just smarter to write it that way, right? It makes your life easier. And then what do we do? Algebra, right? You're like, no. We extend k continuously, and then we apply L'Hopital's rule 11 times, says no one. So divide by k to the 13th. Oh, fine, one more step. This is k to the 13th minus k to the 12th plus 2k to the 11th divided by k to the 13th plus k to the, if you're tired of writing k and you'd like to switch over to n, feel free. I'm getting tired of k. All right, so now, now that I've done that, divide the top and the bottom by the leading power. We get 1 minus 1 over k plus 2 over k squared divided by 1 plus what, 1 over k to the Let's see here. Um, 13 minus 5 is 8, right? And then 7 over k to the 13th, right? And that is manifestly equal to 1 minus 0 plus 0 over 1 plus 0 minus 0, also known as 1. So let me give this series a name. I'm going to call it Bob. Therefore, oh, thus is less writing. Thus, Bob converges by limit comparison test to convergent p 
equals to 11 series. I had the decency to make the problem in the notes much simpler, so <laughs> sorry about that. <clears throat> I thought, oh, I'll make this problem more interesting by making the numerator complicated. In retrospect, I think I should have stuck with my notes. Uh, let's see here, another example. I'll do it with n this time. n equals 2 to infinity of, let's say, 3n um, plus 2 over, you know, um, n squared plus 2n um, plus 1. All right, I, I want to make life easier. This is manifestly positive, right? So I don't need to worry about am I actually in the context where we should work on things. Here, let me call this thing, I'll call this thing a sub, a sub n. It's clearly positive, right? So you guys tell me, is this converge or diverge? What do you think? Converge or diverge? Converge? Well, it, it definitely satisfies the nth term test, right? Um, in, the, in terms of if you take a limit as n goes to infinity, you're getting zero, right? But that doesn't tell you anything about convergence. It just tells you it, it doesn't have anything. There's nothing conclusive from the, the nth term test there, except that it's still in the hunt. So converge or diverge? Diverge, why? Right, because it's somewhere along the lines of 1 over n. Because this, 3 over n plus 2 over n squared plus 2n plus 1, is essentially 3n over n squared for n sufficiently large, which is 3 over n, right? So that's my intuition. If I don't have to show work, if I'm just asked converge or diverge, you don't have to show work, that's it. You do that. You write down the answer. But if I have to explain myself, then here's what we have to do. You can either use direct comparison test, which probably isn't too hard here. Eh. Um, but limit comparison test is nice. So we'll, we'll do, we'll use limit comparison test with p equals 1 series, right? Limit comparison test with p equals 1 series should work nicely here. By the way, LCT, limit comparison test. Unless you guys insist on writing the words out, but if you'd rather to just write LCT, you can do that in your homework and also on the test. Because I know that, like, I think you guys, some of, some of you, I believe you have a belief that, like, you only have a certain amount of writing you can do in your life. And after you've writ written that number of words, then you'll die. So, like, you're just being careful not to write too many words as to not to hasten your death, right? I mean, that's something like this is the idea, yes? So, um... All right, so I need to look at 3n plus 2 over n squared plus 2n plus 1 times the reciprocal of 1 over n, which is what? Oh, fine. <sighs> Let me be dumb and write it out. 1 over n. You guys have driven me to it. I'll write it the dumb way. So here's the limit as n goes to infinity of this, right? Here's my L. All right, so doing the algebra here, we get 3n squared plus 2n divided by n squared plus 2n plus 1, which we can figure out by dividing the top and bottom by n squared. And having done that, limit is calculated. 3 over 3 plus 0 over 1 plus 0 plus 0 using my limit laws, 3. Thus, by limit comparison test to divergent uh, p equals 1 series, um, Herbert. diverges. I decided to name it Herbert this time. 
not enough Herberts there around anymore, you know? It's a dying name. For good name, for good reason. It's like somebody's going to bring back Matilda next year. It's going to be the number one leading female name, right? That would take an act of Disney. You know, you have to have like a Encanto Part Two, starring Matilda. Let's see here. Because we don't watch Disney, we're past that, right? Good, good for you. Um, me too. Anyway, what? Why would it be one over in and not three over in? I divided the top and bottom by n squared. Um, are you asking where? You said it was essentially three and over n squared. Why not use that as we suggest? Why not do what? Isn't uh, three sub n or b sub k in this question? No. No. No, I mean, we, you want to make the original series either the A sub n or the B sub n. I mean, it's up to you. You could choose either one, really, but I'm just choosing the original series to be A sub n or A sub k just for the sake of it's a choice. Um, what, would happen, what would happen here, by the way, if I flipped the meaning of A and B? Nothing much happens except instead of getting a limit of three, you get a limit of a third. That, that's all that happens. So now, guys, like, think about um, um, think about the examples we looked at last class. At the end of class, I had to do something kind of sneaky to deal with the 1 over k squared minus 4 example, right? In retrospect, we could have quickly disp dispatched that problem using limit comparison with, with p equals 2. So, um, you know, anyway. Next example here, I'm going to go ahead and get the projector back out for the next example. Yep. This is probably a dumb question, but how did you determine that that divergence if the limit was three? How did I figure out that, that this was three? Well, I, the limit was three, so how, how is that divergence? Well, the limit is three. Um, and three, so that puts us in case uh, case one. Case one of the limit comparison test, L is positive, right? Therefore, ser this series converges if and only if that series converges, right? Um, oh, and the other series doesn't converge. The other series doesn't converge, therefore, right? So you could do, like, if <laughs> you, you could, you know, <laughs> pragmatically speaking, conceptually thinking, you can also put, you could, you could put diverges here, and you could put diverges here, and that would also be a useful thing to know. If it doesn't converge, it diverges. So logically, those are equivalent statements. In practice, we're using the divergent aspect of this one. So um, is it all in? It's good? OK. Um, so here is another one, uh, 1 over the square root of k plus the natural log of k. Now this one, I just don't know right offhand. Like the kind of quick back of the envelope calculation here, not totally cer certain. I mean, it looks to me kind of like maybe it's dominated by square root of k, so I'm kind of expecting it diverges. But I'm, I'm a little bit on the, on the bubble of things. It probably diverges. Um, so first of all, um, I say let's study it with limit comparison test against the p equals 1 half series. So um, if we do that, we're left with a sub k over b sub k is this, which then I divide and I get 0. I get something that limits to 0. So um, this is not helpful, all right? This is not helpful because I think it diverges, right? <laughs> well, the p equals 1 half series diverges, right? So I've, 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 I've tried a limit comparison with p equals 1 half. I've got that the limit l goes to 0. And I look back at the limit comparison test, and I'm like, Oh, it doesn't tell me anything about divergence, right? It just tells me if this converges, that implies that that converges, right? It doesn't tell me that if this diverges, that implies this diverges. That's not part of this. There's a difference. Up here, this is an if and only if statement. It's a different animal, all right? So I don't get from L equals to 0, diverges implies diverges. If L equals 0 or L equals infinity, I, I don't get to say anything in the divergent category, 
All right, it's like it's only for convergence. So, all right, uh, I'm like, okay, well, I, I thought, you know, I have two options when I'm writing notes. I, I'm, I come to something like this, I can, I can just delete everything I just wrote and not show it to you, or I can show it to you, because this is what actually happens in practice for interesting examples, is you try a test and it doesn't quite work out. So what do you do? Try another test, try again, right? So my next thing was I tried 1 over k. So well, maybe if I compare it to 1 over k, that'll, that'll work. And <laughs> well, then that one went to infinity. So again, that's not helpful because if the L goes to infinity, it only tells you about convergence. It doesn't tell you about divergence. So that didn't work either. So then what did I try next? At this point, I talked to Dr. Sprano. That's what I didn't put in here. But um, I talked to Dr. Sprano. I'm like, I, I don't know what's going on with this example. And he's like, oh. And um, he's like, well, you had to do direct comparison. And then you can use limit comparison after that. And I'm like, Oh, see, because I had been, um, I got this problem from a book I was looking at, you know, and in the book it says use the limit comparison test, which is very unhelpful instructions. I mean, maybe there is a way to use the limit comparison test directly, but maybe not. Um, so what I figured out then was I was like, okay, well, I need to understand how square root of k and natural log of k stack up against each other better, right? So what I did was I, I took the difference of the square root and the natural log function, I differentiated it, all right? And by doing that, I was able to show through this algebra right here that that's a positive derivative. What does that mean? That means that the square root of x minus the natural log of x is a function which grows. If that function is always growing, increasing, what does that mean? That means eventually the square root of x is bigger than the natural log of x. That's an inevitability. Um, and in fact, that happens, I think, relatively quickly. So you can argue that the square root of k is, is larger than the natural log of k for beyond 4 for sure, all right? And once I know that, then I can trade this one for this smaller, I can replace, um, so the square root of k is, is larger, wait a minute. Just a second. Why did I switch the sign? Oh, here? No, no, so, like, so above, you have square root of k plus over k. And then you go to differentiation, you switch to subtraction. Oh, because I'm trying to compare. That's not a direct thing. Uh, I'm trying to compare um, the square root of x and the log x, because I want to I trade. Increased. Yeah, I wanted to trade one of them for the other. And I think I, I, think I got turned around in my logic here, I'm afraid. See, because I, I have showed that square root of k is greater than log k. And so it seems to me that this is incorrect because I'm replacing this step right here. Okay, guys, not everything before it, but I, I'm replacing the square root of k with a log k. What, what does that do to the denominator? It makes it smaller. So my this should go the other way. Um, oh, oh, this is very easy to fix. Like I'll again have to edit the notes. <laughs> um, what should I do instead of what I did? Is instead of keeping the logs, I should have done what? Keep the square root k's because that's what I'm actually entitled to do here. Because if I if I if I replace logs with square root of k, I'm making the um, I would be making the fraction. Um, oh man, that shaking is really bothering me. Um, yes, yeah, so if I replace the log with the square root of k, I've made the denominator larger, which makes it smaller. Yeah, so I, I should really just put square root of k and square root of k here. Then I would have 2 times the square root of k. And then that, I can do limit comparison. Well, I don't even need limit comparison. If I have, if I have the, the, given, the terms in the given series are smaller than 1 over 2 times the square root of k, then I can do direct comparison with p equals 1 half series to do, to, to do this one. So I will fix this. <laughs> All right. I mean, let me put this away here. I'm going to work out the next one. I just, I didn't want to, I didn't want to write that one out because I think it's got a lot of. <laughs> All right, so uh, up next, our next example here. 
So you have problems in your homework that have um, factorials, right? So let's work an example that involves factorial. Let's see here. So the next one um, up against, um, I will do, let's see here, 1 over, am I an example? Example 3. So I'll look at the sum k equals 0. Infinity 1 over k factorial. Right. Let's see here. So I don't know, like this is, this is actually pretty easy to do with just direct comparison test, you know? Maybe we should do that for this one. So here observe um, a sub k equal to 1 over k factorial is what? It's 1 over k times k minus 1 dot 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 3 times 2 times 1, right? So certainly for um, let's see here. So you can say that this is is less than or equal to what? I think we could do, could we do k squared? What's that? Yeah, I mean, let's see here how to, um, All right, well, you know, here's the thing is I don't want to think about it, right? <laughs> so if you, if you get that feeling, <laughs> like I'm having at the moment, I mean, I agree with you for k sufficiently large is, is larger, right? But if we want to, we could just use limit comparison against the p equals 2 series, right? So if we do, say, a sub k over, um, you know, 1 over, n, uh, 1 over k squared, we'd have k squared divided by what? k times um, k minus 1, k minus 2, dot, 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 3 times 2 times 1, right? And so that would be, and w how does that work out? We divide the top and the bottom by k, what, what do you get? I get 1. And I've got, well, um, so when you're dividing the top and the bottom by k squared, we can divide the first factor by k, right? Think of it this way, that cancels, right? The k squared over k cancels, and then I can divide the other k into this one and get 1 minus 1 over k. And then what remains, of course, is your k minus 2 and k minus 3, which I didn't write down before now, and so forth and so on, all the way on to 3 times 2 times 1. And of course, writing the 1 is just, you know, for the sake of the pattern. Great, then what? So the, going back to your question of where is this useful, like why am I showing you the test that's more complicated than Dr. Sprano's class? Like the only reason to do it is really for this example because now we can use limit comparison in this example. See, because this goes to zero. They would not, other sections of CUP, you wouldn't be able to do this because they have the, the weaker version of the limit comparison test in the other section, which is only good for positive L. See, this one goes to zero, and what else? As, as k goes to infinity. Do you guys see that? This, this term is 1, and these are all, you know, this is very large, that's very large, so this tends to zero. Yeah, this is k minus 2 factorial. You could, you could write that, yeah. All right. And then what? Well, then by limit comparison test, so the sum k equals 0 to infinity of 1 over k factorial um, converges by limit comparison with 
convergent p equals 2 series. Now, Dr. Sprano's class sections are not lost without hope because they could do direct comparison on this, as Sam was telling us. I mean, it's not that hard to do, but all right. OK, so let me show you um, the next test here. Yep. How do you choose what P series of P equals? Oh, that's, that's a creative process. There's no strict answer to that. But if I'm after, if I, if, I have, if I have a suspicion that the series I'm looking at converges, and so like one over K factorial, if you think about it, it's like, it's like a P series, but where the P is getting bigger with every term you add. So it's, it's like better than P equals to two. It's better than P equals to three. It, 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 can, it should converge faster than anything in, in, in terms of like a particular choice of P. So it stands to reason that if I compare it to like P equals two, which is sort of the first convenient converging P series, that's like a good choice for me. But I could have just as well done P equals three. It would have just made the algebra more annoying because then I would have had to like cancel more with the factorial to do the limit. Um, but it kind of depends on what you're after. If you're after whether, whether or not you think it's a diverging one or a converging one. But all right, so next up in this, um, in this story is <clears throat> absolute convergence and alternating series. So um, we say that um, a series is absolutely convergent if the series formed by abs the, the series of the absolute values converges. So in other words, if you take a given series, right, and then you add up the absolute value of the series and that converges, then that series is said to be absolutely convergent. Absolute convergence is a stronger form of convergence than just plain convergence for a series. So in particular, if, if a series converges and it's, and it's positive, right, then clearly it's absolutely convergent. This is a very dumb example. Because if the series is positive, right, that means that the absolute value of a sub k is just equal to a sub k. So to say that the series is convergent is to say it's absolutely convergent. In the case of positive series, convergence and absolute convergence are the same thing, as all I'm telling you. The interesting thing is when you have negative terms in your series, really interesting thing happens, interesting things happen when you have negative convergence, as I'll, as I'll explain to you shortly here. So um, this is one of the theorems we have, which is that if you have an absolutely convergent theory series, then it implies convergence of the series. All right, that's, that's very nice. The proof, um, I have two proofs. My first proof is clumsy. That's the one I thought of, all right? This, the first proof I thought of is if you have absolute value converges, well, if you think about your original <laughs> series, if you think about the original series, you've got terms in the series which are positive, right? And you've got terms in the series which are negative, right? If the absolute value of the series converges, that means that somehow both the, that negative part and the, and the positive part of the series that you're dealing with, they both have to separately sum to something finite, otherwise you get a contradiction. That's the heart of my proof. And so in my proof, I basically, I take the given series and I separate it into its positive part and its negative part. I argue that those separately must converge and that the limit, um, the limit of the sequence of partial sums for the whole series, it has to be the difference between the sum of the, partial, the positive partial sum and the negative partial sum. Of course, the, the, if you add together all the negative terms, you get a negative value, C, and so B minus C is actually a positive thing. That's my proof, it's kind of complicated. The proof you'll find in any calculus book is this. Suppose this converges, right? Notice that we can compare the absolute value with the value like this, minus absolute value, less than A, less than absolute value, right? So if you add the absolute value of A sub K across this, we get absolute value of zero is less than A sub K plus the absolute value, less than twice the absolute value of A sub K. But we're assuming right, in the theorem that this is convergent, gives a convergent series. So then by direct comparison test, the series formed by adding the given series plus the absolute value of the series must likewise converge. And as such, 
that implies that the original series, which you could look at as the difference of this convergent series and that convergent series, likewise converges. And that's, again, I mean, the proof in the book, of course, is much more, much more slick. But um, so that's absolute value, um, absolute convergence. Here's an example. Suppose you've got 1 minus a quarter plus a ninth minus a sixteenth plus a 1 25th and so forth on, and so forth and so on, right? This is what's called an alternating series. Plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. Well, if you take the absolute value of that alternating series, right, what happens? If we take the absolute value term by term, we get 1 plus a quarter plus a ninth plus a sixteenth plus a 1 25th, right? Which is, again, the p equals 2 series. It seems like all I'm talking about today is the p equals 2 series, right? But um, it's an important example. So therefore, the given series is absolutely convergent, and therefore it's convergent. So this is the absolute, you could call it the absolute convergence, convergence test, but no one, no one does that. But it, it is yet another test. If we have absolute convergence, that implies convergence. All right. Now here's another one. Consider the series cosine of pi n over the square root of n plus 1. All right. So here, First of all, I want you to recognize something. Cosine of pi n is really just a funny way of writing um, minus 1 to the n. But anyway, let me, I, I guess I don't say that yet. It's in my footnote, which is really actually a footnote right now. <laughs> Sorry, that's dumb. But um, I'll take what I can get. So anyway, the point is cosine of pi n is either 0, it's either 1 or minus 1. So absolute value of that is 1. And so the absolute value of this given series is 1 over the square root of n plus 1. And um, that is a divergent um, p equals 1 half series, as you can see from just writing out the terms, right? It's 1 plus 1 over root 2 plus 1 over root 3 plus 1 over root 4 and so forth, right? p equals 1 half is divergent. So this series is not absolutely convergent, all right? My question, though, is, is this series convergent? So the answer actually turns out to be yes, the series is convergent, although it's not. And you say, well, how do you know that series is convergent? Well, I don't know it in terms of any of the tests we have so far. All right, so we need a new test um, to understand that. And that um, uh, we'll, we'll talk about soon. but. Just to give you a, a, a label for this, if you have a series which is convergent but not absolutely convergent, then it's said to be conditionally convergent. Conditionally convergence are particularly diabolical. Um, I'll explain why at the end of this section. It's really disturbing. But um, anyway, so let's look at um, let's look at this example. This example will help um, make. And I'm going I'm to make a picture on the board of this real big. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> All right, so we're, we're now going to look at what's called the alternating harmonic series. The alternating harmonic series. Now, what do we know about the harmonic series? What example am I on? I've forgotten. Four, okay. I mean, that's not actually true. We went over a bunch on these, didn't we? But um, so <laughs> the alternating harmonic series it looks like this. You've got the sum. Let's say um, I'll use n. n equals one to infinity of minus one to the n plus one over n. So what this is, is it's 1 minus 1 half plus a third minus a quarter plus dot, dot, dot. That's what we're up against. I want to explain to you why this actually is a convergent series. And you can kind of see it in a picture if you just look at it. So let's make this 0. Let's make this 1, all right? And let's start plotting partial sums. Where's the first partial sum? First partial sum, it's right here, S1 
is 1, right? What's the second partial sum? 1 half. One half. Where's that? That's, let's see, right in the middle. I, I, see, I, I don't know. I'm not good at this. How do you get the halfway part? Oh, I should just do this again. So roughly speaking, there's your S2, right? Where's the third partial sum? Is a half. So I add the first three to get the third partial sum, right? The third partial sum, I have the number over here. Let me cheat. 0.833. So that's kind of sort of here-ish. S3, right? Where is the fourth partial sum? If I've been smarter, I've been color coding these. I'll make that S2 red. Where's the fourth partial sum? It's where? Its value is 0.5833, something like that. So it's kind of over here-ish, right? Where's the fifth partial sum? Well, you know, 0.5. Golly, what was it, 0 0.5? 0 0.5833? Oh, this is S. I was drawing S3. What was, what was S3 equal to? 0.833, yeah. And 0.58 was S4. What's S5? 0.783. So where's S6? 0 0.79. So there's S6. That's 0.6. Oh, 0.616. It's kind of here-ish. And where's S7? So it's kind of here, right? And then S8, right? And you see what's happening. And these guys are getting closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer, right? So you have all of your odd partial sums above, right? And all of your even partial sums below. But you can clearly see that the limit of the nth partial sum, it's squeezing down to something, isn't it? Right? And um, if you have a lot more patience than I do, you can calculate the 10,000th ten partial sum as 0 0.693097. And um, the 100,000th the, 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 the partial sum is 0 0.693142, right? So that's where it's squeezing down to in the middle right here. That's the natural log of 2. Now, why does this converge to natural log of 2? That must remain a mystery to us for now. The answer for that will come naturally for us when we, when we look at Taylor's series. But the fact of the matter remains that this is a convergent series, right? Now, I haven't proved it, right? This is not a proof. This is just a, a plausibility argument. But it's, it's, I think it's a pretty strong argument, right? See, the difference with this, such a big difference, when you just make all these pluses, what happens is you just keep going and out and out and out and out like the natural log of n, right? The harmonic series diverges. This one does not. It converges. So the, um, there were grad students at NC State where I went to, went to grad school who, who would sometimes refer to this test I'm sharing with you now as the, um, the wishful thinking theorem. This is the wishful thinking theorem because what it says basically is that for alternating series, all right, for alternating series, the nth term test goes both ways. For an alternating series, if the nth term goes to zero, it converges. So in the case that you have this plus minus being set up and you have that the terms are getting small, in fact, it is true. The series diver it necessarily converges if the, lim if the, if the nth term goes to zero. So here's the setup. You suppose you, you've got positive, positive terms and, and they're you know, being multiplied by a plus or minus factor, right? So like you've got B1 minus B2 plus B3 minus B4 and so forth.